Far in the west, there lies a desert land, where the mountains lift through the perpetual snows, their lofty and luminous summits, down from their jagged deep ravines with a gorge like a gateway, opens a passage rude to the wheels of the immigrant's wagon. Westward, the Oregon flows in the Walloway and the Oye. Eastward, a devious course among the Wind River Mountains. Through the Sweetwater Valley precipitate leaps the Nebraska. And to the south, from Fontaine Cuba and the Spanish Sierras, fretted with sands and rocks, and swept by the wind of the desert, numberless torrents with ceaseless sound descend to the ocean, like the great chords of a harp in loud and solemn vibrations. Spreading between these streams are the wondrous, beautiful prairies, billowy bays of grass ever rolling in shadow and sunshine, bright with luxuriant clusters of roses and purple and mild forests. Over them wandered the buffalo herds and the elk and the roebuck. Over them wandered the wolves and herds of riderless horses, fires that blast and blight, and winds that are weary with travel. Over them wander the scattered tribes of Ishmael's children, staining the desert with blood, and above their terrible war trails, circles and sails aloft, on pinions majestic, the vulture, like the implacable soul of a chieftain slaughtered in battle, by invisible stairs ascending and scaling the heavens. Here and there rise smokes from the camps of these savage marauders. Here and there rise groves from the margins of swift-running rivers, and the grim, taciturn bear and the anchorite monk of the desert climbs down their dark ravines to dig for roots by the brook's side. And over all is the sky, the clear and crystalline heaven, like the protecting hand of God inverted above them. Into this wonderful land at the base of the Ozark Mountains, Gabriel far had entered with hunters and trappers behind him. Day after day with their Indian guides, the maiden and Basil followed his flying steps and thought each day to overtake him. Sometimes they saw or thought they saw the smoke of his campfire rise in the morning air from the distant plain. But at nightfall, when they had reached the place, they found only embers and ashes. And though their hearts were sad at times and their bodies were weary, hope still guided them on as the magic Fata Morgana showed them her lakes of light that retreated and vanished before. Once as they sat by their evening fire, there silently entered into their little camp an Indian woman whose features wore deep traces of sorrow and patience as great as her sorrow. She was a Shawnee woman returning home to her people from the far-off hunting grounds of the cruel Comanches, where her Canadian husband, Cordoba, had been murdered. Touched with their hearts at her story and warmest and friendliest welcome gave they with words of cheer, and she sat and feasted among them on the buffalo meat and the venison cooked on the embers. But when their meal was done, and Basil and all his companions, worn with the long day's march and the chase of the deer and the bison, stretched themselves on the ground and slept where the quivering firelight flashed on their swarthy cheeks and their forms wrapped up in their blankets. Then at the door of Evangeline's tent, she sat and repeated slowly with soft, low voice and the charm of her Indian accent, all the tales of her love, with its pleasures and pains and reverses. Much Evangeline wept at the tale, and to know that another hapless heart like her own had loved and had been disappointed, moved to the depths of her soul by pity and woman's compassion, Yet in her sorrow pleased that one who had suffered was near her, she in turn related her love and all its disasters. Mute with wonder, the Shawnee sat, and when she had ended still was mute. But at length, as if a mysterious horror passed through her brain, she spake and repeated the tale of the Maus. Maui, the bridegroom of snow, who won and wedded a maiden, but when the morning came, arose and passed from the wigwam, fading and melting away and dissolving into the sunshine, till she beheld him no more. Though she followed far into the forest, then in those sweet low tones that seemed like a weird incarnation, told she the tale to fair Linneo, who was wooed by a phantom. 
and through the pines or her father's lodge in the hush of the twilight, breathed like the evening wind and whispered love to the maiden till she followed his green and waving plume to the forest and never more returned, nor was seen again by her people. Silent with wonder and strange surprise, Evangeline listened to the soft flow of her magical words. Till the region around her seemed like enchanted ground, and her swarthy guest, the Enchantress, slowly over the tops of the Ozark Mountains, the moon rose, lighting the little tent, and with a mysterious splendor touching the somber leaves and embracing and filling the woodland. With a delicious sound, the brook rushed by, and the branches swayed and sighed overhead in scarcely audible whispers. Filled with the thoughts of love was Evangeline's heart, but a secret, subtle sense crept in and of pain and indefinite terror as the cold, poisonous snake creeps into the nest of the swallow. There was no earthly fear. A breath from the region of spirits seemed to float in the air of night. She felt for a moment that, like the Indian maid, she too was pursuing a phantom. With this thought, she slept, and the fear and the phantom had vanished. Early upon the morrow, the march was resumed, and the Shawnee said, as they journeyed along on the western slope of these mountains, dwells in his little village the black robe chief of the mission. Much he teaches the people and tells them of Mary and Jesus. Loud laugh their hearts with joy and weep with pain as they hear him. Then with a sudden and secret emotion, Evangeline answered, Let us go to the mission, for there good tidings await us. Thither they turned their steeds, and behind a spur of the mountains, just as the sun went down, they heard a murmur of voices, and in a meadow green and broad by the bank of a river, saw the tent of the Christians, the tents of the Jesuit missions, under a towering oak that took in the midst of the village, knelt the black-robed chief with his children, a crucifix fastened high on the trunk of a tree and overshadowed by grapevines looked with its agonized face on the multitude kneeling beneath it. This was their rural chapel. Aloft, through the intricate arches of its aerial roof, arose the chant of their vespers, mingling its notes with the soft susurros and sighs of the branches. Silent with heads uncovered, the travelers, nearer approaching, knelt on a swarded floor and joined in the evening devotions. But when the service was done and the benediction had followed forth from the hands of the priest like seed from the hands of the sour, slowly the reverend man advanced to the strangers and bade them welcome. And when they replied, he smiled with benignant expression, hearing the home-like sounds of his mother tongue in a forest and with words of kindness conducted them into his wigwam. There upon mats and skins they reposed, and on cakes of the maize feasted, and slaked their thirst from the water gourd of the teacher. Soon was their story told, and the priest with solemnity answered, Not six suns have risen and set since Gabriel, seated on this mat by my side, where now the maiden reposes. Told me the same sad tale, then arose and continued his journey. Soft was the voice of the priest, and he spake with an accent of kindness. But on Evangeline's heart fell his words, as in winter the snowflakes fall into some lone nest from which the birds have departed. Far to the north he is gone, continued the priest. But in autumn, when the chase is done, will return again to the mission. Then Evangeline said, and her voice was meek and submissive, Let me remain with thee, for my soul is sad and afflicted. So seemed it wise and well unto all, and betimes on the morrow, 
mounting his Mexican steed with his Indian guides and companions. Homeward, Basil returned, and Evangeline stayed at the mission. Slowly, 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 the days succeeded each other. Days and weeks and months, and the fields of maize that were springing green from the ground, when a stranger she came, now waving above her, lifted their slender shafts with leaves interlacing, and forming cloisters for medicant crows and granaries pillaged by squirrels. Then in the golden weather the maize was husked, and the maidens blushed at each blood ear, for that betokened a lover, but at the crooked laughed and called it a thief in the cornfield. Even the blood-red ear to Evangeline brought not her lover. Patience, the priest would say, have faith and thy prayer will be answered. Look at this vigorous plant that lifts its head from the meadow. See how its leaves are turned into the north, as true as the magnet. This is the compass flower that the finger of God has planted here in the houseless wild to direct the traveler's journey over the sea-like, pathless, limitless waste of the desert. Such in the soul of man is faith, the blossoms of passion. Gay and luxuriant flowers are brighter and full of fragrance, but they beguile us and lead us astray, and their odor is deadly. Only this humble plant can guide us here and hereafter, crown us with those fertile flowers that are wet with the dews of Nepenthe. So came the autumn, and passed, and the winter, yet Gabriel came not, blossomed the opening spring, and the notes of the robin and bluebird sounded sweet upon wold and in wood, yet Gabriel came not. But on the breath of the summer winds a rumor was wafted sweeter than song of bird or hue or odor of blossom. Far to the north and east it said in the Michigan forests, Gabriel had his lodge by the banks of the Saginaw River, and with returning guides that sought the lakes of St. Lawrence, saying a sad farewell, Evangeline went from the mission, went over weary ways by long and perilous marches. She had attained at length the depths of the Michigan forests, found she the hunter's lodge, deserted and fallen to ruin. Thus did the long, sad years glide on, and in seasons and places, divers and distance, far from seeing the wandering maiden. Now in the tents of grace of the meek Moravian missions, now in the noisy camps and the battlefields of the army, now in secluded hamlets, in towns and populous cities, like a phantom she came and passed away unremembered. Fair was she and young, when in hope began the long journey. Faded was she and old, when in disappointment it ended. Each succeeding year stole something away from her beauty, leaving behind it broader and deeper the gloom and the shadow than there appeared and spread faint streaks of gray over her forehead, dawn of another life that broke o'er earthly horizon, as in the eastern sky the first faint streaks of the morning.